Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. I just want to do a little bit of a, little bit of a prophecy update with you. Uh, I do this just a couple times a year. I did, did it not too long ago. Um, I don't know, about maybe four or five months ago. I can't remember. But, um, you know, especially with everything that's going on in the world, you know, people think World War III is at, at the brink of right, you know, right on us. So um, I figured I'd just keep you abreast of what the scriptures say, what the scriptures say. You know, because we don't need to fear, we don't need to be afraid, we don't need to worry. If you know Jesus, you know, it's all going to work out in the end for you. It's all going to be all right for you. If you love Jesus, it's all going to work out for you. You're going to be with him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, our concern as Christians, you know, should be to, you know, wait for his, com- wait for his coming prayerfully. We should be, you know, watching our own lives. Jesus said in Luke 21 that uh, just watch and be sure that day doesn't overtake you. And the only way it can overtake you, not if your eschatology is off a little bit. When I say eschatology, that means study of last things. What will overtake us is if we're not in Christ. And the proof that we're not in Christ is that we just care about the things of the world. And we're just living for the things of the world. We're not living for the things of eternity. In the morning men's Bible study, you know, I was, I, we were going through the book of Colossians, and Paul makes it clear that we need to seek first things that are in heaven, and we need to set our affections on things above. And the more we do that, we seek things that are above, and we set our affections on things that are above, the more we're going to not be concerned so much about what's going to happen at the end. Not that we don't need to watch and pray and be aware But we're not, we shouldn't get to a point that we're scared. We're afraid. What's going to happen? We know what's going to happen. We know what's going to happen. Jesus told us these things. But I I just want to share with you some thoughts this evening. From Matthew 24, the disciples ask a question again. And, okay, I guess we'll start in verse 1 because we got it up there. All right. Matthew 24, it says this. Jesus is sharing with the disciples, you know, what is going to happen in the last days in, in regards to Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. This is what he says. Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See not all these things? Truthfully I say to you, there shall not be here left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, hence they call this the Olivet Discourse, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when, these thi- when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Okay? So the disciples are enamored with the temple and the building of the temple. And they say, Jesus, is it, look at these structures that, that were built here, built by Herod the Great, okay? And Jesus says, let me tell you something about these structures. These massive stones that they put in place to build the temple, there's not going to be one stone left upon another. Then they're a little shocked. They're like, what do you mean? Because especially in the Jewish mind, the temple was the center of all worship, Okay? They had to travel there. They took pilgrimages to the temple multiple times a year to worship the Lord. So when they hear this, they're like, Lord, what do you mean? So they go to Jesus in private and they say, Lord, can you tell us when these things are going to happen? What's going to be the sign of your coming in of the end of the world? They ask him a few different questions. Because to them, if the temple ended and was destroyed, that was the end. That was the end of all worship. They didn't fully get it yet that they were going to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. If you remember, even after the resurrection, right before the ascension, they asked Jesus in Acts chapter 1, they say, Jesus, Jesus, you know, is it now you're going to restore the kingdom to, to, to Israel, to Jerusalem? And Jesus says, you guys still don't have it, but I'm, I'm about to ascend, and let me tell you what you're going to do. It's not given unto you to know exactly when the restoration of all things is going to happen. But you go be my witnesses. 
Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. That's the church's job. That's why we're here today. Because there's 750,000 people that live on the North Shore, and less than 2% of them believe in Jesus Christ. Believe in this book. That's why we do what we do. So when they hear about the destruction of the temple, they go to Jesus privately and they say, Jesus, can you tell us when this is going to happen? What's going to be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? So when's the destruction of the temple going to happen? What's going to be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Again, in their minds, destruction of the temple and end of the world is one thing, but it's not one thing. There was a long pause in between Jesus' first coming and we're still waiting for Jesus' second coming. Jesus talked about this in a couple of his parables. Now stay with me. Stay with me. I got a lot of information here for you, but you got to stay with me. In AD 70, in that generation, the temple was destroyed. Literally what happened, it was the end of the Jewish age, the Jerusalem age. Jesus said in John 4 that the, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. He says, now don't, not on Mount Gerizim to the woman at the well, not in Jerusalem. He goes, that's all going away. That's old covenant. The old covenant was come and see the things of God and the people of God. The new covenant is go and tell, go and tell, plant churches, get the gospel out to all the world. So in AD 70, the temple was destroyed. The Romans came in under Titus Vespasian, and Titus Vespasian actually said, don't destroy the temple. Let's keep it intact. A couple of soldiers got drunk as they were occupying the temple courts. They started to fire arrows into the temple building. The arrows went into the building while Jerusalem was under siege, and what happened was the tapestries lit on fire, and it literally, with all the gold and all the metals and all the wood that was inside the temple, it was like a wood-burning stove, and the gold literally melted down in between the, these massive stones, and the Roman soldiers said, hey, the temple's already destroyed, and they literally spent days and weeks prying off the stones, one from another, to get the gold out from in between the stones. Jesus' prophecy was fulfilled. But you know it wasn't fulfilled yet? The sign of his coming in the end of the age, the end of the world. Because the Bible tells us that in the last days there's going to be some, another worship structure that's going to be built somehow in Jerusalem and that temple is going to be destroyed also and an antichrist figure is going to set up shop there and that's when you'll know you're in the last days. Look what he says. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no one deceives you. Now again, Jesus is speaking as a prophet. He's speaking to his disciples, but he's also speaking to his people all the way down through the centuries. When a prophet spoke, he spoke to the people that were near and close to him, but there was also a far interpretation. So he's speaking to us. Take heed that no one deceive you. Now look, look what this says. This is very interesting. As I was praying and studying this week, it was very eye-opening. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You say, what's so eye-opening? We heard that verse a million times, Pastor Matt. Let me just explain this to you. Know what I, I thought that verse meant for decades? This is going to be new information for some of you, so you, you got to pay attention now, all right? Stay focused. If I see you doing this, I'm going to yell, get up. All right, now listen, and stay with me. I'm reading that verse, and I'm studying, and I'm praying, and I'm listening to sermons, and I'm reading, and I'm reading. And for, for years, I thought it meant that people will come in the last days and literally say that they're the Messiah. They're the Messiah. He says many, not just one, not just an antichrist figure. He says many will come in my name, right? Saying, listen, shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. I, I used to think that that meant for decades that people are going to come and say, saying, I'm Jesus. Like David Koresh in the Branch Davidians 30 years ago. Remember that wackadoo? Okay. All right. All right. He was Jesus. He was the Messiah to his little cult and all this stuff. And I used to think, people are going to come and say, I'm Jesus, I'm Jesus, I'm Jesus. 
Who's that going to deceive? Who can that really deceive? People that can read the Bible can know, oh, all right, you're, you're Jesus? I don't think you're Jesus. I don't think that's what it means. People saying, I'm Christ, I'm Christ, I'm Christ, I'm Christ, I'm Christ. Well, there can only be one Christ. So how can many come and say, I'm the Christ, I'm the Christ, I'm the Christ? You know what he's saying? People are going to come in the last days saying that. This is going to bring it right home for you. Saying that I am Christ, that Jesus is the Christ. They'll come in the last days saying, I am Christ. Saying Jesus is the Christ. Christ is speaking. He said, many will come in my name. He's speaking to his disciples. He's looking at them. Many will come in the last day saying, I am Christ. And they'll deceive many. Think about this now. Do you see the difference? If you're paying attention, you see the difference. When I was studying this and when I read this, when I was praying over this, I said, Lord, you know something? These days are right upon us. They're right upon us. We're in the last days. People all over the place saying, he is the Christ. He is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. But they're deceiving many. They're deceiving many. They're deceiving many with prosperity. They're deceiving many with seeker friendliness. They're deceiving many with your, great your greatest and your best life now. They're deceiving many. They're saying that Jesus is the Christ. Many will come in my name, Jesus speaking, saying, I'm the Christ. But they'll deceive many. People aren't that dumb if there's all kinds of Christ figures walking around, and they're going to say, they're going to say, hey, I'm the Christ, I'm the Christ, I'm the Christ. You know, you might be able to lead a little cult somewhere here and there. But and on the masses, on the whole, the churches of Jesus Christ aren't that dumb to fall for all these messiahs. But that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying many will come in the last days saying that he is the Christ. But they'll deceive many. People are deceived. People are deceived. We live in a day of easy believism. We live in a day of, you know what, you know, grace and you can do whatever you want and receive Jesus and all your problems will go away. You ever hear that one? Receive Jesus, all your problems will go away. I say this all the time. I didn't know how many problems I had until I received Jesus. <laughs> I received Jesus because I didn't want to go to hell. That's why I received Jesus. But then Jesus started to show me over the years just how messed up I am. That without him I can do nothing. That in me dwells no good thing. There's people that are pastoring churches all over the world, all over the country that do not stand on the teachings of Scripture, that are afraid to say what the Bible says or they just totally disregard it. Fighting a political fight, fighting a gender fight, fighting all these things, hanging stuff, stuff outside these churches all over the world. We, it, the apostasy is upon us. And they, if you ask every one of them, they'll say, Jesus is the Christ. But they'll deceive many. You shall hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. All these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. All the way down through the history of the church, Wars, rumors of wars. Wars, rumors of wars. Wars, rumors of wars. But I'm going to tell you the difference between the wars today and the wars over 100 years ago. In the wars today, exactly what Jesus is going to say can happen. Look what it says. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilences, earthquakes, and diverse places. All these are just the beginnings of sorrows. The wars today can be nation against nation across whole oceans. Nation against nation. Wars and rumors of wars. These things are going to happen. If you Google how many wars are going on right now in the world, you can do it after. I guarantee it's more than one. We only hear about one. People have been warring in Africa for 
decades. Decades. Talk about famines. We don't hear about them because we ain't starving. There's been famines going on in the world hundreds of years this last century like never before. Now, know what people are doing? They're saying, all the prophecy buffs are saying, hey, you know something? Well, Russia, Russia's Gog of Magog, and Russia is going to come down. That's Ezekiel 38 and 39, by the way. Russia's going to come down. They're taking over Ukraine, and then they're going to come, and then they're going to come down, and they're eventually going to try to take Israel, and God's going to deliver Israel miraculously, and that's when we all go out and we avoid tribulation. And I told you, I used to believe that for years, and then I read my Bible. And I can't find one verse, not one. People have got mad at me over this. They left the church, but I'm just saying, if you can tell me one verse that tells me I get to go away and be with Jesus before tribulation happens, I, I, I want to believe that. The church has been under tribulation since the beginning. John said in Revelation chapter 1, your companion, your brother in tribulation. Jesus said, John 16, John 14, in the world, you will have tribulation. And they do, they do this, well, well, the church isn't going to endure the wrath of God. And I'll say, no, that's not what the Bible says. The church will never endure the wrath of God. God's people will never endure the wrath of God. But it's crystal clear that we endure the wrath of Antichrist. That's what it says. People have run to other churches that, that want to just tell them, you know, don't worry. I'm, I'm, sorry. I, I'm not afraid of that. I'll just tell them, make it quick, please. You know what I mean? Make it quick. Because I love Jesus. By the way, Ezekiel 38 and 39 is very interesting. I don't have time to go there. It's the battle of Gog of Magog. Some people think it's looking behind the scenes to the spiritual realm. That God could be Satan... Okay, Magog is the area, it's either northern Turkey or southern Russia. There's debates on that. Through Ezekiel's eyes, it would have been northern Turkey. Okay, now stay with me. So it says in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that there's going to be this last day's battle, okay, as the nations are warring against each other. And all the Middle East is involved. And God even says, God says, I will gather all nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's Armageddon. That's Megiddo. That's Esdraelon. Same place in different times and eras. Now stay with me. God says, I'll gather all nations. But I'm going to tell you what I think Ezekiel 38 and 39 is, and I think it's real clear. Ezekiel 38 and 39 is right at the end of this last day period that's coming on the earth. The last seven year period that's coming on the earth. It's right at the end. You know how I know that? I don't have time to turn there. I had two other whole scriptures I wanted to get to. I don't know if I'm going to get to them. But listen, I know that because Ezekiel 38 and 39 match up exactly what Revelation chapter 19, which is the end, which is when Jesus comes and returns. Just like he says at the end of Matthew 24, he says, come and feast at the great supper of God. Come and feast. You know what that means? Now God's going to come to judge all the people who are trying to destroy one another, destroy Israel, destroy the Christians, destroy the Jews. God says, come and feast at the great supper of God. Now I'm stepping in and I'm going to judge the world. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, is right at the end. Read Revelation 19. So we don't have to worry about all these wars. Jesus says they're going to happen. All these are just the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you. Not just talking to the disciples, talking as a prophet down through the ages. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Listen, that couldn't have happened to the apostles in the first century. They were hated of the, the Middle Eastern nation, some of them. But now Christians, we know there's a whole world out there. This is close. You're going to be hated for all nations for my sake. When this happens, 
Many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. He's talking about people that say they, they're believers and Christians. Listen, you know this. It's getting more and more difficult for you to say that Jesus is the way to heaven and Jesus wants holiness and righteousness in my life. He wants me to turn from my sin, be not deceived, fornicators, idolaters, homosexuals, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's what Paul says. But then he says this, praise the Lord. He says, and such were some of you. Again, Christians aren't better than anybody. We're just forgiven. And people that struggle with these things, they battle. It's a sin. But you've got you to call. You've got to say to God what it is. I say, bring them all in. Bring in the homosexuals. Bring in the trans people. Bring them all in. We'll preach the gospel. We'll tell them about Jesus. We'll love them to the cross. That's what we want. But I'm going to tell you this. What's going to happen is if they don't agree with what the scriptures say, they're going to end up hating And if you stand on what the scriptures say, you're going to be hated. And you're going to be persecuted. But Jesus said, blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness sake. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. For so persecuted they, the prophets which were before you. Don't be afraid. Great is your reward in heaven. Now listen. Listen. Look what he says here. And many false prophets again shall rise and shall deceive many. Verse 12, and because the iniquity, iniquity, iniquity shall abound, it'll get worse and worse, the love of many shall wax cold, cold, but he that endures till the end, the same shall be saved. You've got to hold on to your faith. This is what I believe. I believe in the old reformed doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. What that, what's that, what that means is this. That means if you're really saved, you're going to persevere doesn't mean you're not going to fall sometimes and make mistakes and sin, but if you're really saved, you're going to get up and persevere. And then it says this, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world, listen, in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end will come. And then he's going to give a sign of the end. This is what I talked about in the last prophecy update was verse 15. So we're not going to go there just yet. We're not going to go there. He says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. That the true word of God is going to get out to all nations. It's going to get out to all nations, whether it's on the radio, whether it's on the internet, wherever it is. Jesus said this, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the, in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Now listen to me. The days of Noah were pretty evil. People send me these things to my phone. I was just talking to my wife about this. They send me these, check this out, check this out, check this out. So I'm checking out stuff, and, I, and I'm hitting this, I'm hitting that. And do you know how many times I've had to download TikTok, then delete TikTok? <laughs> do you know why? I mean, it's addicting. Seriously, what's this not doing now? And what's this guy doing now? But right... All right, everybody's doing like weird stuff, all right? So then, but you can't even, it's not, so I get the thing, I deleted it yesterday, someone sent me something today. So I had to download it again to see because it was something about a prophecy update in Israel. So I'm looking at it, right? Then I start doing this. I'm like, well, let's see what the next knot has to do. Let's see what the next knot. And every third or fourth one, there's this half-naked girl doing something disgusting. Everyone, and I'm like, oh, try to, uh, and you can't even get away from it. So I had to delete it again. And then someone will send it back to me, and then I'll, I'll have to delete it again. I mean, we're in the days of Noah, man. The evil is rampant. It's all over the place. You can't even get away from it. Look what he says about the gospel. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world unto a witness. What's the gospel of the kingdom? Or better, what does the kingdom, if you really are going to the kingdom when you die, what is your life producing? And this separate, listen, this separates the saved 
from the unsaved. The true believers from the fake ones. Or as Jesus would put it, the wheat from the chaff. Remember Jesus said, sometimes you're not going to be able to tell. You'll be able to tell a little bit by their fruit. But I wanted to go there in Matthew 7. I don't know if I'm going to have time. But listen. This gospel of the kingdom. What's the kingdom? Know what Paul said to the Roman church? If you are going to the kingdom when you die, you should have some kingdom living within you. To have a kingdom, you need a king, right? And we say the real king is Jesus, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And that's what I believe. But if we're part of that king's kingdom, right? If we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ and we're part of that king's kingdom, right? And if we're the subjects of the king, then we should reflect the king a little bit Don't tell me that, Pastor Matt. I believe in Jesus. I pray to pray. I'm going to heaven. You don't reflect the king at all. You ain't going. And if you don't care about reflecting the king, you ain't going. Remember what Paul said to the Roman church? He says the kingdom of God isn't a matter of meat and drink and all this stuff. He goes the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. You hear that first word? Righteousness. It's not a matter of meat and drink and doctrine and all this. All doctrine, it's all important. But if, if you believe in Jesus, is it producing righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost? Sometimes Christians are the most miserable people. Miserable. Righteousness. Peace, joy, righteousness. I don't hear this stuff preached that much anymore. Righteousness. You know what righteousness means? Basically, make, make it real simple for you. That there's someone and something that is right, and if you don't align with that someone and something, then everything else is wrong. And the scriptures are clear that God is right, and his word is right, he honors his word even above his own name, he said, right? And he's right, and everybody else, everything else, every ideology, every other false religion, every other so-called gospel is wrong. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. You have, you have the peace of Jesus? Do you have joy in your life no matter what's going on? Is God producing righteousness in you? Becoming more like Jesus Christ? Is he producing holiness in you? Are you allowing him to do that? Are you casting out the old leaven so you can be a new lump? Are you, can, know what Christians do? They continually deal with sin. That's what Christians do. We can't say sin anymore. We can't. We have to say there's something wrong with people's brains and this and that, blah, blah, blah. No, the Bible says it's sin. That's what it says. It's sin. But if you're a Christian, you really love Jesus, you deal with sin. Thank you, Jesus. You took that sin away. I'm putting it back on the cross with you. You died, but you took it away. God, I've been letting it creep back in again. I need your righteousness, Jesus. Because I told you this. It's real simple. You know what Jesus did for you? When you believed in him, you reached back to that cross, and all your sin was put on him. But you know what the scriptures tell us? That all his righteousness was put back on you. time all right give me seven minutes of speed here all right go to second thessalonians chapter two real fast second thessalonians in, in second thessalonians they were struggling they were battling well well it's we're, we're under intense persecution under intense persecution you know what's what's going on and they thought they were they they missed the coming of christ they thought they missed the rapture they thought they missed the gathering and Paul writes to them clearly to tell them, you didn't miss nothing. There's going to be troubles. There's going to be trials. There's going to be tribulation. You didn't miss anything. And he's going to tell them exactly what's going to happen first. He says, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. 
Again, I was taught f f for years that those were two separate events. It's funny, we just, we just sung it in the song at the end. He's coming for his saints. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's coming, and our gathering together to him, our rapture, resurrection rapture. Don't be shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, word, letter, as from us that the day of Christ is at hand. He goes, don't fall for any of this stuff. Let no man deceive you. Don't anybody trick you. That day will not come except there come a falling away first. And I just taught you all. I think we're right in it. We're real close to the falling away. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, though that is worshipped, so that he, that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? And he's going to give us some of the characteristics of what this person's going to be like. When Jesus comes in verse 1, he's going to come and resurrection rapture us. And we meet the Lord in the air, 1 Corinthians 4. I mean, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15. We meet the Lord in the air. Resurrection rapture. And then he's going to judge the world. Look what it says. Look in verse 8. I don't have time to get into the whole thing about who the restrainer is and all that and this and that. That's a whole other thing, but you can text me afterwards and I'll tell you. All right. And then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord, Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. When's he going to do that? He told you in verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering. We get gathered. We are in his brightness. When we see him, we'll be like him. We'll see him as he is, resurrected bodies. We meet the Lord in the air, and then the Lord is going to come, and he's going to judge that wicked one, and he's going to judge the world. Look what it says. And then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this. Remember I just told you when Jesus said, many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many? I was thinking, Lord, what are these signs and lying wonders going to be like? What are they going to be like? What's it going to look like? What's the signs and wonders going to look like that are going to deceive people? And while we know that the scriptures tell us that there'll, there'll, there'll be such a point that the wonders will be so deceivable that they'll be able to call down fire from heaven somehow in the presence of people. What do these signs and lion wonders look like? I think they're all around us. I think they're right on your phones. You know what people believe just by looking at that stuff? You know what they believe? You know they believe the lies? Lying wonders. All the craziness that people do. You know what people believe? It's right on your phone. It's right in front of you. Call down fire from heaven in the sight of many. What does that look like? Is, he gonna, is it going to be an authentic miracle like Elijah did when the fire of God's holiness came down? It ain't going to be that. Falling down fire from heaven. It says in the book of Daniel that the last days Antichrist will be a God of munitions, warfare. That's what they're going to care about, warfare, munitions. Fire from heaven like nuclear war and rockets and things of that nature and people in shock. Who can go to war with the beast? Who's like him? Who's like him? Who's like him? Who can do this? Listen, it, we are so close to the coming of Jesus Christ. Now when I say Maranatha, Lord, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus. 
All, all, all the younger girls are saying, no, don't come yet. I want to get married. I want to get married first. And then you'll be married for two years. You'll like, Lord Jesus, come. Lord Jesus, come. Lord Jesus, come. Right? All right, last but not least, I'll be real quick, real quick. Go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. He says this, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be that are going in that way, sadly enough. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leads to life. Few there be that find it. I want to be that few. I want you to be. I want more coming in. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but intimately are ravening wolves. Listen, you shall know them by their fruit. Do men gather, gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? The answer is no. Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings forth not good fruit is hewn down, cut down, cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not every one that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Not everyone that says, I am Christ. I am Christ. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. Lord, didn't we cast out devils? Didn't we do all these great works? Didn't we preach in your name? Didn't we point people to you? I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. How can you know them by their fruit? Because the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. And if I'm healed or not healed, or if God makes me rich and God gives me everything I want, that's not what the kingdom of God is all about. That's deceivableness. You're deceived. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. You'll know them by their fruit. Praise the Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I'm... Lord, I just... Can't help but think right now is just my mind just went to the Last Supper, Lord, when you sat with your disciples and you said to them, one of you shall betray me. And the disciples looked at each other and they asked you, is it I, is it I, Lord? And Lord, I think that's the right heart that we need to have, Lord. I think we all have a little bit of Judas in us, a little bit of Peter in us, Lord. But Lord, we love you, Lord. We have a little bit of John in us, Lord. We have a little bit of Paul in us, Lord. Search us and try us and know us, Lord. Lord, see the wicked ways in us. Lead us in the way everlasting, Lord. Lord, Lord, purge us, Lord. Lord, have your way in us, Lord. Put us through whatever we have to go through, Lord, so we can reflect your image more, Lord. That's why we're here, Lord. Empower us, Lord. Bless your people. Be with the hurting. Be with the sick, Lord. Lord, you told us we're your church. We're your body, Lord. Lord, help us to be your hands. Help us to be your feet, Lord. Help us to be your eyes and your tears, Lord. Help us to be your mouthpiece, Lord. To one another, Lord. You said all men will know we are disciples if we love one another, Lord. Have your way in us, Jesus. Receive our praises in your name.